Hello everyone, I'm Emma and this is Anita. Hello, we will talk about meteors and plasma physics. So, what is popularly known among people as a shooting star is actually a meteor that appears when a meteorite, a tiny particle of interplanetary dust, enters the Earth's atmosphere. On their way through the atmosphere, some meteors burn up completely, while some of them fly through it and reach the surface. Those, those remains that fall to the Earth's surface are called meteorites. What actually happens when a meteor passes through the atmosphere? At the moment of entering the atmosphere, meteorites have a high speed and thereby significant kinetic energy. On the way to the Earth, they slow down significantly and their kinetic energy is converted into heat energy and light that we can see. By entering the atmosphere, they compress the air in front of them, which heats up and it eventually heats up the body. After heating to sufficiently high temperatures, ablation starts. That is the next stage of atmospheric penetration of the meteorite where the surface layers of the meteor evaporate. The particles that have evaporated ionize the air around them. By recombination, that is by returning electrons to the ionizing atom, energy is released in the form of light. When there is no longer enough kinetic energy to either evaporate or to provide heating, ablation ends. Then, there is a sudden cooling of the body and the solidification of the crust takes place. The surviving meteor continues to move without emitting the light because there are not enough hot gases around the body anymore to emit visible light. And this is the part of the trajectory known as the dark flight. In collision with the Earth's surface, larger meteors form a small pit, which is somewhat larger than the size of the body itself, while smaller ones only settle on the ground. The interplanetary space is filled with a cloud of tiny particles, meteorites orbiting the Sun. Comets and asteroids are thought to be the main sources of the meteorite population known from observation from Earth. It is generally accepted that the particles are ejected from the cometary nucleus and consequently from a meteorite stream. However, there are also more studies dealing with a meteorite streams of probable asteroidal origin. When a comet approaches the Sun, sublimation occurs and in this way, meteorites are ejected from the comet nucleus, while meteorites of asteroid origin are formed due to the collision of an asteroid with another body. In both cases, the ejection velocities of the meteorite are significantly lower than the orbital velocity of the comet or asteroid. For this reason, meteorites are limited to moving in the orbit similar to the one which the parent body has. So, meteorites move near the trajectory of a comet on an asteroid orbiting the Sun. If the Earth, on its way around the Sun, passes through a meteorite flow of particles, meteors appear in the sky and that is what we call meteor shower. To the observers from the Earth, because of their perspective, it seems as if all meteors which belong to the same shower came from one direction, that is, it seems as if they all originate from one point in the sky called the radiant of the meteor shower. Each shower is named after the constellation in which its radiant is located. So, there is, for example, a meteor shower of Perseus named after the constellation Perseus, a shower of Leonids named after the constellation Leo, and so on. Different observational methods are capable of getting various data on meteorites and their interaction with the atmosphere. Standard methods of observing meteors and meteor showers are based on photographic, visual, telescopic, TV or radio techniques. Most known method is visual method because it is accessible to most people, but it is extremely subjective because it strongly depends on the experience and ability of the observer. On the other hand, radio method is independent uh, of the weather condition and the time of the day, which enables detection of the data in meteor showers. Radio observation is also much more accurate, especially in the area of low brightness meteors. Visual and radio observation of meteor showers determines the zenith of the rate, which gives the activity of meteor showers. 
In visual observation, zenith Euler wave is value that represents the number of meters we would see in ideal conditions, like a completely clear sky, no moonlight, away from a city light and pollution, and radiant at zenith. In addition, we determine this value under the assumption that the radiant is at the zenith and the limit magnitude is 6.5. Zenith hourly rate is given according to the formula shown on the screen, where f, c and k are the corrections. f is for cloudiness, c is for the boundary magnitude and k is for the zenith distance of the radiant. t is the duration of the period in which n meteors were seen. In radio observation, zenith hourly rate is calculated by the second formula on the screen. And instead of correction factors, the observation function p is used, which depends on the configuration of the transmitting and receiving radio device, power and distance of the emitter and oscillation of the number of meteors. The spatial density of the meteor shower is represented by the population index r, defined as the ratio between the number of meteors and magnitude. It is determined experimentally by the visual or radio method according to this formula, where Vi is the total number of recorded meteors which brightness is greater than Mi. It has been shown that the brightness of a meteor depends on the size of the meteorite from which it was formed. We can say that the brightness of a meteor is proportional to the mass of the meteorite. The mass index S defines the mass distribution inside the meteor shower and it is expressed by the second formula shown on the screen, where phi i is the total number of meteors with a mass greater than mi. From those two formulas, we came to a direct relation between the mass index and the population index, that is, we obtained the relation between the meteorite mass and the glow of a meteor. The spatial distribution of meteors brighter than 6.5 is standardized per relation shown on the screen, where A is the standard effective surface of the meteor observation and N is the meteor velocity. It's in our interest to calculate the density and that information we get with the second formula. Finally, by analyzing all the collected data, we came to general characteristics of the observed meteor shower. And based on the knowledge of the meteor shower, we came to the information about the properties of main common from which it was formed. A side effect that occurs when a meteor passes through the Earth's atmosphere is an ionized gas that we see as a light trail on the sky. The linear density of ionization, that is, the number of electrons per meter, is determined according to the formula on the screen. Traces of ionized gas have different behavior, which is caused by different electron line densities. According to that, we have underdense and overdense meteors. At the underdense meteors, the electron line density is below the value shown on the screen, while overdense meteors have line density above that value. Continuous observation of meteors and meteor showers can help us in the search for meteorite bodies, which is of great importance because there is a possibility that they carry organic material that has had an impact on the development of life on Earth. Likewise, since meteor showers originate from comets, further research seeks to improve knowledge about the evolution and formation of the solar system since the comets that make up most of the showers were formed during its creation. And that was a small part about meteors and meteor showers. And we hope it was interesting to you. And we also hope that you will now look at the night sky with more interest.